This evening we're going to continue in Romans chapter 5 where we had been a few weeks back looking at the first several verses there in Romans chapter 5. We want to pick up there this evening. If you remember the from the outset in Romans, after the Apostle Paul had told the Christians there at the church in Rome about the glorious gospel and its power, he then spelled out for them in perfect clarity and wonderful clarity how in need they were of this gospel being applied to their souls, pointing out that they, and we can switch over and apply it to ourselves as well, we are sinners. We're all sinners. In fact, the apostle said it this way, we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But because of the gospel, because God intends to save a sinful people, he sent his son. And the apostle makes this clear as well, that Christ suffered the just for the unjust, that he might bring us, us type sinners, that he might bring us to God. As a result of Christ's suffering on our behalf, we are justified. Each and every individual who believes in Jesus, who trusts in Jesus with their whole heart, is justified before him. That is a right legal standing before a good God. This is the way that Paul says it in Romans 4. Those who believe in him who raised Jesus, our Lord, from the dead, they are counted righteous. It's almost unbelievable. We don't really understand how bad we are if we aren't amazed with the reality that if we believe in him who raised Jesus, our Lord, from the dead, that we can be counted righteous. Our faith reckons us as righteous before a holy God, before a just judge. But not only did Jesus die for our sins, he arose. Christ has been raised from the dead, the apostle says. Raising him up, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for Jesus to be held in its power. Jesus, who is God, could not be held in the grip of death, but rather he conquered death, not only for himself, but for all of his people. He who was delivered over because of our transgressions, and was raised because of our justification. Which brings us to Romans chapter 5. And I want to read, as we've done previously, verses 1 through 11 in Romans chapter 5. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we exult in hope of the glory of God. And not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance. And perseverance, proven character. And proven character, hope. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who is given to us. For while we were still helpless... At the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man. Though perhaps for the good man, someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we exult, pardon, we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Right from the top, therefore, because of what Christ has done for us, we experience justifying peace. Because of what Christ has done for his people, we have this introductory access into the throne room. We, we have a word. We have a right to be there and a right to speak to our Heavenly Father. 
because of what Christ has done for his people, for us, we have a certain hope. Because of who Christ is and what he's done for us as his people, we have a guaranteed glory, which is the ultimate end of salvation. It's the ultimate end of our salvation, the glory of God. Paul doesn't just stop with this glorious moment of, listen, you're justified in Christ and one day it's going to be great. But but he fills in the gaps for us, the, the everyday difficult Monday mornings, we might say, pointing out that great tribulations are going to come, trials are going to happen in our lives. But these tribulations, these difficulties, these trials that come, they will not, they cannot rob us of our standing in Christ. In fact, the apostle makes clear here in Romans chapter 5, the difficulties, the trials that we face, the tribulations that come, they serve to confirm our standing with God. They establish us in God. They remind us of who we are in God as his grace comes alongside again and again, moment by moment, day after day, supplying all that we need to stand firm in the midst of trials in the midst of troubles, in the midst of tribulation. Because, how does it happen? These tribulations bring about perseverance. We continue pressing on steadfast because of who God is in Christ, which results in proven character, which brings us back to that certain hope that we have in God. So because of who Christ is and what he's done, there's a justifying peace. There's an introductory access. There's a certain hope. There's a guaranteed future glory, which causes us to rejoice now, even in the midst of life's difficulties, because it produces perseverance and proven character and hope. Coming back, as we've said before, full circle to that certain hope that we have in God. And all of this the apostle makes clear at the end of verse 5, is based on God's love being dispensed into our hearts, just dumped out profusely into our hearts and our lives. The love of God has been poured out. Not a little dab here or there, but dumped profusely into our hearts. And the evidence of God's love is not in our circumstances. It is easy for us to look around and consider the trials and the difficulties of life and somehow assume it's the way that we're wired because of sin that God doesn't love us or question whether or not he loves us based on our circumstances. But the evidence of God's love is not in our circumstances. And and that's where the Apostle Paul continues with the train of thought here in Romans chapter 5. The evidence is not in our circumstances, but at the cross. The evidence of God's love is at Calvary. Look again, verses 6 through 8. What Paul says here is unprecedented. While we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Verse 8, God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us not just unprecedented, but unparalleled. There, there isn't better news anywhere. I mean, the, the devastating description of mankind that's listed here in, in verses 6 through 11, Paul says, we were helpless, we were ungodly, we were sinners, we were enemies. And in the midst of this devastating description of who we are as men and women, There's this exceptional evidence running alongside, exceptional evidence of God's love. We're helpless and ungodly. Christ died for us. We're sinners. We're enemies. We're saved by the death of God's Son. The statements that he makes here, we're helpless while we were still helpless. We didn't make a little progress along the way and then somehow this god decided oh they they're doing a pretty good job i think maybe i can come alongside and help them out a little bit but we were still right right in the height of our sinful career and christ died for us 
right when we needed him. That's at the right time. We were helpless, that is, unable to save ourselves. We were helpless. We were under the condemning power of sin. We were helpless. We were incapable of any spiritual good. We were helpless. We were unwilling to come to him for mercy and grace. We were helpless. We were uninterested in what God was offering. While we were still in this state of helplessness, at the right time, at that time when we were most needy, Christ died for us, the ungodly ones. Ungodly, repugnant to God himself. Everything that God is not, we were. Wicked, heinous, repugnant to his holiness, rebels against his nature. Is this not proof of unprecedented and unparalleled love? That while we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. He didn't die when we had started making our way towards godliness. We were deep in the throes of sin, ungodly and rebellious and repugnant. And Christ died for us. God demonstrates his own love toward us, verse 8, in that while we were yet sinners, the third description, we were helpless, ungodly, sinners, that is, unrighteous in all our deeds, unrighteous in every aspect of who we are, wholly disabled spiritually by our sins, that is, dead in our sins, dead in our trespasses, sinners twofold, by nature, because of our sin, in the garden and by choice because of actual sin that we continue to do. How we think, how we talk, the deeds that we do, we are sinners, unrighteous, lawless. And then one more statement. Helpless, ungodly, sinners. And verse 10, we were enemies. We weren't just out there hating God from a distance. We weren't just out there disinterested because we didn't know that God exists. According to the apostle here in Romans 5, we were enemies. That is, there was hostility between us and God. And what's worse than that, there was hostility from God toward us. We were his enemies enemies, helpless and ungodly, sinning enemies. And it's at that time Christ died for us, at the right time. Listen to the way that the Apostle Paul writes to Titus, for we also once were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. What do we hear? I mean, other than a spiritual autobiography, what do we hear when we read these, voice, the, these verses? Listen to the words of Jesus. It's not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. So when we find ourselves in the camp of foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to lust and pleasure, spending our life on malice and envy, hateful and hating one another, what we ought to hear is we qualify. We qualify for this grace and for this love. Our very problem, the fact that we're sinners, qualifies us as recipients of God's love. When we are spiritually bankrupt and helpless and ungodly and wicked and enemies of God, rebels of his glory and thieves of his honor, that's evidence that we qualify as recipients of God's love in the gospel. Listen, our predicament and the predicament of all of mankind makes us eligible for salvation. 
only sinners are eligible. That's what Jesus says in Mark 2.17. It's not those who are healthy who need, need a physician, but those who are sick. I didn't come to call the spiritually healthy. I came to call sinners. The Apostle Paul continues there in Titus 3. We were foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But that's who we were, but we qualified for the gospel. Therefore, verse 4, when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared in Jesus Christ, he saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, because there aren't any, but according to his mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. And then verse 7 Paul goes a bit further and explains what he means here. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man, someone would dare even to die. Now, there's a bit of a comparison. It's more comparison than contrast when we look at the righteous man and the good man. The difference is probably only this that the good man is a little better than the righteous man. The righteous man does what is right, he's merely correct. But the good man is governed by love and goodness as he does what is right. Paul is being a bit redundant, most likely, in saying it's quite unlikely, it's possible, it happens, that someone would die for a good man. Hardly someone would die for a righteous man. Perhaps for a good man someone would dare even to die. We can think of illustrations where this would happen. A fellow soldier on the battlefield. That has happened often. Someone who's willing to die for a comrade. A family member. No doubt there are people who would die for a close family member. For a famous person. It's feasible to imagine that someone would lay down their life. Particularly for the fame that would be involved. But no one's going to lay down their life for an absolute failure. No one's going to volunteer to lay down their life for ungodly sinners, for enemies of everything that you're about. No one's going to volunteer to lay down their life for people like us. It's unfathomable that a good God would send his own dear son, the eternal one, the altogether lovely one, to suffer shame and ridicule and death and forsakenness for ungodly, helpless, sinning enemies like us. But, verse 8, he did. God demonstrates his own love toward us. R remember, this love that's demonstrated toward us is not demonstrated towards that ideal image that you have of yourself. God's love is demonstrated towards ungodly sinners who are spiritually helpless and helpless and enemies of his glory. God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Here's the demonstration, the, the condescending, the stooping down to express his undying love through the death of his son. It's, it's not a love that he demonstrated 2,000 years ago, it's present tense. God is continuing to demonstrate to the Christian. There's a present reality, the demonstration of his love. I mentioned earlier, when we look for confidence in God loving us, we don't look to the circumstances here or there, but we look to the cross. God demonstrates his own love toward us. And this is how Christ died for us. God's unimaginable love has been poured out into the hearts of helpless, ungodly sinners. This love is abundant, amazing, 
absolute. It's no wonder that Wesley writes the glorious hymn, Amazing Love, How Can It Be? that you, my God, should die for me. Those words flow off our lips wonderfully when we sing, but attempt to wrap your mind around it. It's this, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And at every verse, most of us would put the pen down and stop writing, but the Apostle Paul can't stop Much more than, verse 9, it gets even better. He uses an argument from the lesser to the greater. Using two points in our salvation, justification and glorification. And in his argument, justification is the lesser, not because it's a small deal, but because it's already accomplished. So the greater, the glorification being saved from the wrath of God on the day of judgment is guaranteed. God has already done the difficult part using human terminology. If we've already been saved from God's condemnation by being justified, Paul writes, how much more shall we be saved from his wrath on that day? After the indescribable demonstration of his love in saving us that the Apostle Paul has spelled out, there should be no surprise when we read that his gracious effort will keep us all the way to the end. He's not going to let us go at the end. Our legal standing with him has been dealt with. Our personal relationship with him is absolutely guaranteed. Christ died for sinners, achieving both of these stages of salvation for us. The apostle breaks it up in the death of Jesus Christ on the one hand and the life of Jesus Christ on the other. Much more than, verse 9, having now been justified by his blood through his death, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God, Through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. The the risen life of Christ will complete finally in that day what the death of Christ on earth began. This is the way that Jesus said it, John 14, 19. Because I live, you will live also. The humiliation, the stooping, the condescending of Jesus saved us when we were far off. And his exaltation at the right hand of the Father will secure us finally since we've been brought near. We were enemies and he saved us. Now we're friends, we're children. Will he not bring us all the way home to glory? His humiliating death saved us. His exalted life will keep us forever. Romans 8, 34, Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of God? Pardon, from the love of Christ. We can't be separated. It's, it's the death, burial, resurrection, ascension, and eternal reign of Jesus Christ that guarantees all of our salvation from beginning to end. Our salvation is wrapped up in him. In his death, particularly, it is the supreme proof of God's love. While we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were enemies, we were reconciled to God. Through the death of his Son, we will be reconciled, ultimately, and saved by his life. The death of Christ on the cross, the the separation that he experienced from his father as he hung there on the tree at Calvary is the greatest, the unparalleled, unprecedented statement of God's love for us, for his people. It is also the ultimate requirement of God's law. What we owed, a death that we could never pay, a debt and death that we could never pay. Christ paid. He secured it for his people. The ultimate requirement and the supreme proof of his love happened at the cross. 
So how can we be sure? How can we be sure that we will not finally be lost? How can we be sure that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus? How can we be sure that in the end we do not hear, depart from me, I never knew you? According to the Apostle Paul, this is how. God crushed his own dear son for us when we were his enemies. He will certainly save us now that we are his friends. That's the argument that he makes much more than verse 9. Even better than him demonstrating his own love toward us. The apostle saying it. It's hard to imagine it being better. But finishing the race is actually better. Running well is glorious, but it doesn't compare to seeing him and being made like him and living with him out of the presence of sin forever. If while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God, verse 10, through the death of his son, again, much more. Having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. If he reconciled us while we were his enemies, he will certainly save us. Now that he's made us friends. This is a powerful argument. Paul is arguing that we will, all those who are in Christ, will inherit a full and final salvation. Listen, this is not sentimental optimism that gets us through. The way that Paul writes, it's actually irrefutable logic. The more costly part has been paid, Christ's death secured the less costly part the eternal one who lives forever is absolutely guaranteed it's not sentimental optimism it's not even baseless optimism it's confident cogent confidence listen to the words of augustus top lady in his hymn the work which his goodness began the arm of his strength will complete. His promise is yea and amen, and never was fortified yet. Things future, nor things that are now, nor all things below or above can make his purpose, can make him his purpose forego, or sever my soul from his love. Nothing in the future, nothing in the present, not things below, not things above, can sever my soul from his love, is the way that Top Lady says it. He continues, my name from the palms of his hands, eternity will not erase. Impressed on his heart, it remains in marks of indelible grace. Yes, I to the end shall endure. Confidence, as sure as the earnest is given. Listen to this statement, more happy but not more secure the glorified spirits in heaven. This is the, the argument that the Apostle Paul is attempting to make. That's where he's trying to bring us to what Top Lady is singing here. We should be confident about enduring to the end because of the deposit of what the earnest, the spirit, the love of God being poured out into our hearts. And we should find ourselves not quite as happy but not any less secure than the glorified spirits in heaven. More happy, but not more secure, is the way that Top Lady says it, the glorified spirits in heaven. The only way this happens is for us to believe what the Apostle Paul is writing here, that we've been justified by faith. We have peace with God through Jesus Christ. We've obtained an introductory faith into the throne room. We've received, received grace upon grace. We exult in hope of the glory of God, even in the midst of tribulations, because it brings about perseverance and proving character and guaranteed hope because God's love has been poured out into our hearts. How do we know this, Paul? Because while we were still helpless, right at the time when we needed it most, Christ died for us while we were ungodly. While we were still sinners, he demonstrated his love toward us by crushing his own son. He will keep us all the way to the end. Listen, he saved us while we were his enemies. 
He's made us his friends. He's made us sons and daughters. He will save us finally. And then again, the Apostle Paul continues with stacking icing on top of the cake, we might say. Verse 11, and not only this, but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Not only this. Can you believe there's more? There's enough to live on already. And still, the Apostle heaps on more truth for us to bank our souls on. Because the Christian life is not merely looking back at our justification. And it's not just looking forward to our glorification, though both are true and guaranteed if we're in Christ. But we have to live now in between justification and glorification. And we exult in the midst of it. We, we rejoice in this life, this present life that we're living. We rejoice in God because of what he's done, what he's doing, and what he will do through the gospel, through the death, burial, resurrection, ascension, and eternal reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. So not only are we welcomed by God as our Father, but here we are encouraged, and enticed, lured to feel, to experience the glorious bliss of our position in Christ. Not to just meander along humdrum through this life hoping that one day it's going to get better no but rather we look at god in christ and and what has happened for us in the gospel and we rejoice in him Uh, the point is this he began with with reconciliation paul is pointing out we're not just reconciled we shouldn't just be reconciled but if reconciliation has happened We should also be rejoicing. That's been the thread throughout. Verse 2, we rejoice in hope. Verse 3, we rejoice in sufferings. And now verse 11, we rejoice ultimately in God who is in control of it all, who is saving us for his glory through the work of his Son. This rejoicing, any rejoicing for that matter, for the Christian, it's not a theological chest thumping. It's not, well, I know how it's all going to end, so I'm okay. It is humble, confident triumph through Jesus Christ. We rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's through Him. Everything has Christ as the primary focus. Verse 1, we have peace with God through Christ. Verse 2, we have an introductory access to the throne room, and that's through Christ. We've been reconciled, verse 9, and that's through Christ's blood. We will be glorified with him, verse 10, through Christ's life. Christ is, is the center for, for the apostle, and that's, that's the goal of this portion in the letter. He's attempting to, to encourage us to lift our eyes up away from the trials and tribulations and the difficulties and find all of our satisfaction in who God is for us in Jesus. And giving us reasons why we ought to feel that way because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts because he's demonstrated and continues to demonstrate his own love toward us. It's this love of God, particularly in Christ, that is the foundation for our salvation and not just the foundation, but the ongoing assurance of who we are in him. There is no good which is not in Christ the excellencies here on earth are but his footstool the excellencies that exist in heaven are his throne how excellent he himself must be his treasures are infinite and they're available to you to all who come to him in repentance and faith wherever you find yourself whatever bondage christ can deliver you From all your fears, from sin, which is the worst of all evil, Christ can deliver you. From yourself, which is the most hurtful of all your companions, Christ can deliver you. From death, which is the most dreadful thing imaginable, Christ can deliver you. From Satan, the most subtle of all of our enemies, Christ can deliver you. From hell, the most horrible of prisons, Christ can deliver you. From wrath, the most 
horrifying doom of all sinners, Christ alone can and will deliver you if you come to Him. Why refuse this life in Christ? All of heaven is enamored with His glory, with His beauty. He is, as the Scriptures say, the altogether lovely one, that tender, loving, faithful friend that is ever near. He is the brother that is born for your adversity. His grace and His sympathy will prove sufficient for you. The great secret of a life of faith in Christ is to depend on Him daily. To go to Him in every trial, to cast every burden on Him, to find in Him the rock who will never be moved. So that we might set Him before us, setting Christ before us as an example to imitate as a fountain to wash in, as a foundation to build upon, as fullness to draw from. Setting Christ before us as our tender, loving, confiding brother and friend to go to at all times and under all situations and circumstances. And why wouldn't we? Because God has demonstrated His own love. He demonstrates His own love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. Much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Let's pray. Our Lord and our God, we thank you for the truth of your word, and we pray that you would grant much grace to all of us as we hear, that the, the truths of Christ and of the gospel would penetrate deeply and affect eternally, in order that you might be honored and your Son might be glorified, in order that we as your people might be edified and sanctified. God, set us apart, we pray, for your honor and for your glory for our immediate good and for our eternal go good. God, hear us and help us. We thank you for what you've done for us in Christ, saving us so undeserving. But yet you, in compassion and love, reach down, condescending in the person of your Son, taking on flesh like ours, yet without sin. You saved us. God, help us to revel in that glory, to bask in the love that you've displayed through Christ in order that we might live ever before you, lives of gratefulness, rejoicing, even in the midst of trial, especially as your people in the midst of trial. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.